Yes, of course, I'm sorry. Institution like a liberal arts institution like College of Charleston is to 
crack open my process and to be as revealing as possible about how I do things because that feels the most educational. And I still think I want to hang on to some of that, but it felt like it was also important to contextualize the kind of work I do by the current events because it would be unconscionable not to do that. So um, there is a new urgency in spending time thinking about the places that you know, 10 years ago um, it was unthinkable to imagine that we would be on the brink of a possible nuclear war. Um, I woke up at 6 a.m. First new headline I read was U.S. intelligence confirms that upper-level Russian officials are talking about, you know, tactical nuclear, um, uh, you know, uh, attack. So it is actually a terrifying time. Um, and the crisis is a layered one. Um, it's also a humanitarian crisis. Uh, the Ukrainian population is terrorized by daily shellings and is tortured raped and executed in occupied territories. Um, hundreds of thousands of children have been kidnapped and forcibly brought to Russia. Um, it is a horrifying time. It's also a political crisis, obviously, for the US government, um, for European nations, like the West is frantically trying to figure out how to help just enough to not piss off Putin more, um, which is a pretty messed up game to play. Um, but it's also an intellectual and personal crisis for me, as, and, or anyone really, I think. My friends that have, are anthropologists or sociologists or historians that have worked in the region have had to rethink everything about how they do things uh, in that place. Because all of us have been guilty about overshadowing Ukraine and only thinking about it as a kind of extension of Russia, where the seat of power is in Moscow and the Kremlin, and everything is made in relation to that. Um, so it has been both like long overdue, but also challenging to realize that the way one has been thinking about things has actually been wrong. And it's... Uh, been a good exercise for me, both humbling but also really healthy, to look at work, assume that I know what I think about it, because I made it, and I've narrated it and explained it, and realize that meaning is really slippery. That just because there's one day you assume that something means one thing, and context can change all of that. And you're always working in relationship to a bigger world, no matter what the nature of your practice is. So I'm going to start at an embarrassing beginning, which is with work that I made, um, just a handful of pictures, but work that I made as an undergraduate um, at Wesleyan. So um, I was you know, exactly in the same place as you guys are, um, but you know, I began um, this, this picture was taken in 2000. Uh, I was 20 years old, and um, just as a quick um, way of autobiography, I moved to the United States from Soviet Russia, so it was still the Soviet Union, in 1990 um, as a 10-year-old. Uh, it was a pretty fascinating time to move because it was just two months after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and only a year before the dissolution of the USSR. So my departure happened at a time of a huge, you know, colossal geopolitical change in the region. So when I went back for the first time in 2000, it was to witness a place that was dramatically different than my childhood memories of that. And, you know, 10 years old is a kind of interesting time to leave because I was old enough to still feel very connected to the place, um, but young enough that I fairly quickly assimilated and you know, speak good English and, and so on. Um, but in many ways, the reason why I went back is to um, rediscover myself and rediscover roots in that kind of like way that young people feel like they need in order to understand themselves and their own identity. 
Um, also, interestingly enough, and maybe coincidence, maybe not, um, it was the very beginning of the Putin presidency. And um, whether we want to or not, that figure looms very large um, politically all over the world and certainly in my work. Um, so I also was motivated by uh, a kind of um, intellectual, small intellectual crisis I was having. I studied at Wesleyan. At the time, the person who headed the photography program was pretty exclusively interested in nude self-portraiture. That was what the students were softly required to do. Um, it's pretty, it's, it's just like unbelievable to think about it now, but he was the head of the program for almost 40 years and got away with it. Um, so when it was my senior year and I had to work on a thesis, I just, I got so fed up, I rejected the whole thing and casting about for a subject, not knowing where to go, since all we were taught is to think about the body and take off our clothes, um, was to go back to the place that was a kind of anchor for me. Um, this was taken on the very first roll of film that I shot there. Um, and it's a, it's a kind of holy site for Russians. This is a 12th century church. Uh, it is um, very bucolic and beautiful. Um, you know, on kind of superficially, the picture is about that timeless beauty, you know, the black and white, the clouds, the hazy light, the cute kids frolicking in the water. Um, but now, in sort of, again, context, you look back and there are all of these other things that appear in this image that seem much more sinister or quietly so. So, um, for instance, um, the first thought I had was like, how many of these eight to ten year olds are in Ukraine now killing civilians? Like, I would venture to say a lot. <laughs> or even the way in which the church, the Russian Orthodox Church, has been complicit in the kind of genocide that has been happening in Ukraine, even sort of promising people who will go and die there um, in sort of quote unquote liberated Ukraine because you know, there's place in heaven for them and so on. So the way that it represents this idea of the Russian world, this is Putin's line, is Ukraine is not a real country. Ukraine is not um, it's a fake place that is really just a part of Russia because it's part of the Russian world, and that ties to the idea of the church. Um, or this, another early picture, and it's pretty heavy-handed, you know, again, I'm not like proud of this work, but um, when I took it, and I remember, I was sitting on the couch, this kid runs in, and it was a very instinctual, like I remember being like, he is so cute, and the self-adoration and the kind of way in which it links to violence in the form of the gun is really disturbing. So that's all like totally available. I don't think you have to be a professional, you know, um, someone who talks about art to get what the work is doing. But then um, there is this other thing, which was, I don't know why I was looking at this, um, this is Putin as a child sitting on his mother's lap, and there is a kind of uncanny resemblance there. Not because, you know, like there's a lot of little boys that look like that <laughs> who grew up in, in Russia, but the, cro the, you know, the closely cropped blonde hair, the blue eyes, which, you know, it's a black and white picture, but there are light eyes, and so the assumption is that they're blue. Um, you know, that's, that's, that connection is, there, and um, maybe it's a stretch, but if you think about, and again, I've read so much about it, like the story of childhood trauma that you know, Putin has told that then maps onto the national trauma, right? The like hurt pride of Russians who have felt like they have been wronged or slighted or humiliated by the West in the years after the dissolution of the Soviet Empire, like that is all part of the anger and the violence that has led to this catastrophe that is happening in Ukraine right now. Um, it was also, you know, again, this was a kind of 
to use a very general word, documentary project, I honestly, like, I don't think I would have been able to really articulate very well what I was doing, but I was walking around with a 35 millimeter camera making pictures of things that struck me, and part of what struck me was things that I recognized from when I was a child, or things that felt new and different. So the Soviet Union, you know, was a castle. It was a place where people were captive in you know, that way that um, propaganda in the West would describe it as this gray, soulless place where everyone was trapped. Like, visually it actually kind of looked like that. So um, the transition to free market economy was something that was like immediately obvious when to someone who left 10 years ago and then came back. Um, so, and it was also funny, like the way that English language would be used in this awkward translation. So I kept encountering these pretty, you know, there's a lot of irony for me um, in, in making these pictures. Um, so the so-called bears, you know, um, have always needed food and money, and so the kind of side hustle that people did at the time as a way of making ends meet was just part of the culture of the place. So as a Russian American, I was really fascinated by that change and particularly attuned to that idea of translating you know, capitalism <laughs> to this new context where a country was basically essentially learning how to consume for the first time. It's hard for an American to sort of understand that because so much of everything we do is just seeped in this. But there, it really went from, you know, standing in line to buy food to all of a sudden there being all of this, these things that were widely available. So just to take a step back from politics, um, I did. I returned for the second time, and these are pictures from my second trip, which was six months later, um, and I wanted to make a more focused project than something that I felt was like quintessentially Russian. And I landed on the Russian bathhouse. So I don't know if anyone has been to a Russian bathhouse. There's a few in New York City. Um, they're kind of, you know, Turkish bathhouse is somewhat similar, but it's an intense, it's an intense experience. And certainly the version that existed in 2000 that has since disappeared was also really intense. Um, so my greatest desire as a photographer, as a young photographer, having looked at Robert Frank and, you know, Winogrand was to make these pictures that compelled people to look, to seduce, to seduce the viewer. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to, I'm going to show people things that you know normally you would not see. And um, it's not easy to photograph in that house. I think I made some initial attempts to see if it was possible to make this collaborative. Very quickly, I was told no. And I would never advise my students to do this, and um, I don't think I would do this again myself. But at the time, in my youth, um, as a 20-year-old, 21-year-old, I was like, I'm just going to make these pictures like while using the bathhouse. So I was naked, I had a towel, I had a camera hidden under the towel, and I would whip it out, take a picture, and then I would hide it, and like just pray that I wouldn't get caught. And I would bring my grandmother with me to protect me because she kind of looked like this woman here. And sometimes I would shoot at the hip. Um, so it was a like it was a very adrenaline like experience. Like I did not have time to really think about composition and you know this and that. It was tribes film that I was pushing. But there was some like an energy in these pictures that I appreciate now. That in some ways signals even though, again, I could never have articulated it then, but in hindsight, I can see some of the things that I'm still really interested in. So um, there was kind of grace and tension in the movements. Like the people who attended the bathhouse were people that went there every week at the same time for 30 years. This was not a glamorous place. This is not a kind of Western spa. It was a gritty, cheap, um, authentic place. And, um, you know, they would like, people would fight over the very, like the perfect way to heat up the steam room or to 
like fight over buckets. It was it was like you, like you needed someone who was a regular in order to shepherd you through this. And um, it was also like an egalitarian place. Um, it was one where you know people would come and hang out there for hours and perform these beauty rituals, which are so interesting. I mean. You know, like everyone sort of can get a version of that, weighing yourself, looking at yourself in the mirror, putting the scrub on. But it had this tinge that felt both really tied to that specific time that was disappearing, but also um, was very much rooted in the kind of Russianness of, of the place. So um, I didn't think about it until later, but part of what I was doing was, I was very much an outsider, right? I was an American, 21-year-old, hanging out, with them, well, not hanging out, but surreptitiously photographing these older women um, in this place that did not look like me. Their body did not look like my body. Um, so I was, I was an outsider. My perspective was like that of an outsider, but not entirely because I did grow up going to one of these with my mom and my grandmother, and I remember what their bodies looked like in this space. And so that, like that positioning of being an outsider and an insider simultaneously was something that has been really essential to the way that I have worked and continue to work. Um, so it was both like I was participating in recognizing things, but also able to look at it from a distance in order to see things in the space that would maybe not necessarily strike someone who, for whom this was a kind of daily reality. Um, and more thematically, part of what uh, was really exciting that I saw, you know, the, the, the times that I went was that everything was kind of choreographed. I mean, these are documentary pictures. And these were not staged in any way, shape, or form. No one saw me take them. Um, but because everything was about a kind of ritual, and people did this repeatedly, there was a perform. It felt like a performative space. And later, again, as I've become more mature as an artist, that has been very central to. That's another um, rich territory for me. Um, so. I graduated from college and you know worked a bunch of odd jobs, waitressing, was an administrative assistant, just sort of trying to get by. I did teach um, at a very young age. Uh, and then I got a grant to that meant that I didn't have to do um, you know have these day jobs, uh, but I could just concentrate on work. And really, if I don't think I had got that grant, you know, when I was 23, um, I don't think I would be standing here right now. It's, sort of amazing to think how things can be a fluke like that. So I wanted to change things up. And as I mentioned, you guys have amazing mentors here. Like it's clear, you know, based because I know some of them, but also just based on how people, you know, think and talk about their work. Um, I knew nothing. <laughs> I took two classes and that was black and white film photography one, black and white film photography two, and the only thing we were taught was nudes. So I had this, but I did have this thought that the black and white grainy work was too indebted to, you know, the people like the artists that I've admired, like Frank or Kudelka, and that I really needed to shake things up and find a language that felt more contemporary and had other possibilities. So totally on a whim, and again, I'm going to say embarrassing things, but it was 2004, and I found Sleeping by the Mississippi, which is the Alex Soap book that came out that year. He was not a known entity. He like won a contest, and so the book was published. And I was like, this is good. There is something here that I'm really into. And even, you know, it's interesting, because I remember like the portraits feel fake. I don't really like the portraits, but I really love the still lives and the interiors and the landscapes. And so I bought that book and um, carried it with me and returned back to the former Soviet Union. So I had funding for a full year, and my when I wrote the grant, it was to live in these um, industrial towns in the Arctic North and photograph sort of the 
aftermath of closing of all of these industries. And I did go, and it was one of the worst experiences of my life. It was just so incredibly tough and depressing. But what was worse, the pictures I was making were so predictable. It was just like, here are Russians living in shit, you know? So I, I knew that this was, it felt like this is too easy, and there's already a lot of it done, and I need to find something else. And so then I was left without even an idea, since I just scrapped my, my grant proposal. Um, and I remember I would just get up in the morning, have my, you know, whatever I ate for breakfast, and then I would just wander around with a Mamiya 7. So I did get a medium format camera with some of the grant money and color film, which I was using for the first time. And I found a lab, so I was processing film and making contact sheets as I went along. And I remember seeing this picture and a contact sheet and being like, this is it. I think my, like, this is the beginning of um, my new project. Like, I, I did somehow recognize that this was going to bear the rest of the work. And I think what it was, um, was the specificity of certain objects, like the watermelon peel, in a space that otherwise feels dilapidated and um, abandoned. Um, there is a, like, there, it's more about feeling than a specific subject. And that was that sense of loss or sense of disintegration or sense that something used to be there that was happy, this is at Gorky Park in Moscow, that has then kind of fallen apart was part of what I wanted to meditate on and it was just much more personal. Like it wasn't political, um, here's a picture about the dissolution of the Soviet Union, it was more about my own sense of loss and disconnection from my own past. Um, this is the only image that I allowed myself to take that had Lenin in me because I felt like it was like, it's too cheap, it's too easy. I did that as an undergrad, I can't do that anymore. Um, and, uh, but this was just too good, it was too strange. I, I mean, there is an interesting side story to the photograph that's taken in Sevastopol in Crimea. So those of you that are up on the politics of the place, Crimea is really what began the huge conflict that is the war between Russia and Ukraine. So Crimea was uh, part of Ukraine. Uh, in 2004, when I went there and made this picture, it was Ukraine. But Sevastopol is a Russian-speaking city, and it was initially part of Imperial Russia. So Russians have always felt like Crimea was their place, and yet it was territorially a part of Ukraine. Um, so I think in some ways, and the, the place is part of the title, and of course, again, it's very charged right now because in 2014, um, Putin's first move of aggression was to send um, special forces in, you know, without any kind of insignia and just kind of take the place over and hold a referendum and declare that Crimea is no longer Ukrainian, it's part of Russia now. Um, so, but like, it's Lenin and it's a very strange sculpture of Lenin cropped at the crotch, like it's a very uncomfortable, um, you know, whoever was the person that made decisions about how to make it, you know, it's like usually a bust or a full sculpt, full size statue, but this was like this half thing at, you know, a kind of um, emasculated version because it really goes like through the crotch. And also this is right in front of a bathroom and a bus station. So this is not a space of, um, you know, it's, it, 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 it's not put up on a pedestal in a place of honor anymore. It's almost like he was going to get thrown away, but they didn't quite throw him away. They decided to just keep him around in this secondary space, almost like a kind of forgotten plant along with the other plants that were there. And um, now I look back at it, and to me what that picture says is the extent to which attachment to Soviet ideas was still very much present for people. Like, no one wanted to let go of communism. Or maybe not no one, but there was a real reluctance, and again, that plays into the politics of today. Um, 
I've never been sadder. <laughs> I think that during this year I spent in very cold <laughs> Moscow. Uh, I mean, I traveled all over, but Moscow was my home base. Since that's where I'm from. I was staying with my grandmother, who did cook really well, but you know, there was only only so much that food can do to offset being like very lonely. You know, my boyfriend was in America. My friends were in America. I was just by myself. Uh, it's a hard place to meet people. It was also like negative 30 degrees outside most of the time. So I would still, you know, put on all my super warm clothes and go out and force myself to make these pictures. And I'm sure like my own mental, you know, space is part of what's being projected there. But I think it was more than that. Um, and this is something, this picture is interesting to me. Like this image I remember seeing it, and maybe this is something those of you that do photograph, something to think about, like when are the times you know you're about to make a great picture, and when are you surprised when you find it on the contact sheet? And with this, I was like shaking, I was like, oh my god, I can't mess this up, this is so good. Um, and, because it was, it's a more, you know, obvious shot. And this one was one where it was just like intuition and instinct, and it's frankly the much better photograph but it was one that I had to find in the context sheet because it's just quieter. There is less going on there. So much of it is about color and form and the way that space gets disoriented because of how the lens compresses it. You know, the way that little house is nestled between the fence and the concrete post, the cut off trees and the palette, which is very painterly. It almost, I mean, the, um, Projector always makes everything more contrasty, so it's it's much softer um, as a print. But still, I think you get the idea um, that it felt like this beautiful place that has been sapped of its um, purpose somehow. And it took me a few years. And again, this is going back to like putting on my um, teacher hat for a second. One of the things that students frequently like, comes up a lot in class is, do you have to know what your idea is before you make something? And frequently you don't. Um, frequently the meaning is there, but maybe kind of subconsciously, and can be articulated later in reference to other pictures or in you know with your own like when you have time to edit, and so. It dawned on me that really what this picture is about is that absence of ideology. So, you know, we all live in an ideological world, like, you know, the United States, of course, is a very polarized place right now, in you know, the blue and red America, and the kind of contrast between these two places has never been greater than it is right now. But let me tell you, it was nothing compared to communist Russia. So ideology was something that was like shoved down your throat at every possible moment. Um, every kid had to join the Young Pioneers, which was basically the kind of baby communist group. Um, every telephone pole had some kind of communist propaganda and the hammer and sickle and all of that. Like this was plastered everywhere. So to be in this world where these things were taken down, like all of this insignia and sort of lang symbolic language, but it wasn't replaced with anything, like this was really before advertising, because the thing that replaced it eventually was advertising, right? Like global capitalism came running in and filled that space. But I was there at that moment, that in-between moment where the kind of uh, you know socialist, um, propaganda was removed, but nothing else has filled that vacuum yet. Um, and also, again, like being more transparent, I was just trying to teach myself how to see in color because I didn't know what I was doing. I was like walking around trying to understand what it means to use color and uh, like what does it mean that this picture is has a blue palette? What way does that imbue a new kind of meaning? And it was um, challenging because I didn't take color theory. No one taught me that. <laughs> and I didn't even know enough to know to read about it. So um, everything was very much about me just kind of almost feeling my way in the dark, trying to 
um, figure something out, looking at contact sheets, um, and so on. Um, but it was also about like these visual representations of history and sort of things. Did I really already talk for 50 minutes? Um, 36. Okay, I don't know why. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, but I do feel like I need to speak this up. Um, so yeah, like the idea of the snow that has melted to create this mark along the building is almost a way to um, do a, an archaeological like sample of you know a way that experience has mapped itself on this building accident. Um, like these violently chopped trees, the birch is a Russian, it's a, it's a symbol of Russia, so the birch trees, like the natural trees, or um, the equivalent of like a the bald eagle for Americans maybe. And so to see this brutish way that they were chopped down to sort of think about that as a metaphor for the bigger historical experience. Um, so in the beginning I was only doing I was only walking outside, and then I had this awful, awful, terrifying experience where I was um, arrested for taking the, these kinds of pictures. Um, I was too close to the KGB building, um, and I got swept up and taken to the police station, and they threatened me, and they were like, you know, we can just keep you here for 48 hours, and you'll probably get raped. I don't know. No one is even know where you are. Like, for an American, like, this was completely, completely horrifying. And so they took my passport, they took my film, they took my camera. I mean, I did eventually get these things flat, but like the cruelty and total lack of life. Like these are police threatening a 23-year-old with rape. Like how insane is that? So um, I got really freaked out. And there were days that I just like couldn't make myself go outside. Like some days I felt braver than others, and so I started going into homes. And you know, ironically, it was a good move because I could, uh, like, the work needed that intimate space as opposed to just the outside, like pastel buildings with peeling paint. But I wish I learned that lesson in a different way. So, um, what was interesting about all of these spaces, and I, I, I didn't just take pictures in Russia. I was all over, um, well not all over, but I, I traveled a fair amount. I traveled different parts of Russia, it's a big place, it's all quite different, you know, eight time zones, not just three. Um, but I also went to Uzbekistan, which culturally, in terms of language, is completely different. Um, I was in Georgia, which is also different, Ukraine, um, far north, far east. And one of the things that was just sort of astonishing um, was that the interiors all looked the same. Like everyone, like people had the same stuff. It was really hard to have a kind of private sense of style because there were so many, so few things that were sold. So people had the same refrigerator and the same curtains and the same tchotchkes and the same color palette. And of course, that changed quickly as soon as you know IKEA showed up and stuff started getting imported. But um, at that time and that period there was this like a sixth of the world <laughs> like landmass all had the same apartments. Um, and that was something I definitely thought about. Um, I mentioned this, this kind of pre-advertising moment and this is a great example of that. This is a professional photo studio, but you wouldn't know it based on how they, um, you know, try to, uh, get customers to come in. So this was meant to be like, you can get one of these headshots. Um, and this is a little kiosk that sold um, hair dye and someone meticulously cut out all the fronts of the actual hair dye boxes and scotch taped it to this board and created this little collage. But it's also it's kind of scary. I mean, first of all, you can't tell what the different hair colors are because of all the rain and snow and everything, it's all blue. But it also, I don't know, the thing that I thought about when I was making the picture was that they looked like either missing people or like mail order brides or something that was not meant to be like, yes, I'm fantasizing about this new identity that I could have as a result of dying on hair red. Um, and then there was, you know, some images like this 
which were sort of decidedly not culturally specific. Um, and this one's maybe one of my favorites. It was in St. Petersburg. And the thing that I, you know, it just didn't look. It, I thought I was looking at mountains, which of course don't exist in St. Petersburg. It took me a second to understand that it's like an illusion of a landscape, that it's uh, just the way that the paint happened to heal and create this like beautiful thing. And you know, this is a real, you know, those of you that try to figure out, do you want to make pictures in the studio or do you want to go out in the world? Like this is one of those things where you can never create this. Like you can only like stumble on this and then just hope that you capture it in a way that honors the actual like beauty of, of it, which you know hopefully I did. <laughs> um, and uh, this is you know a more again more like direct and, and I should have said I pretty consciously avoided photographing people and maybe it was because Alex I didn't like Alex Oak's portraits and I was like I'm not gonna do a portrait. Um, but I think it was, you know, again, probably not a very um, conscious thought, but one where, like, the people are the thing that was missing. I felt like that was missing from this world, and so that made sense, but instead there were these indirect representations of lives through individual stuff that people had, or statues or photographs and so on. Um, but this is, you know, kind of idea of this blindness. Um, of people as they like feel their way through the world um, because of how the snow covers the eyes and the hands almost feel like you're kind of scrambling around. And this is the last image of, um, this is in my parents' old apartment building, it's the mailboxes, which I mean, I love the careful way that all the numbers are very individual, like no single number is written in the same way and using the same writing utensils, um, so in a way it's about the kind of craving for individuality while also being the same. And there's a, I, don't know, I guess the thing that it reminded me was almost like places where people put cremate, you know, um, ashes. So it felt very funerary to me. Um, so then I went to grad school. I was shocked <laughs> that, I, I mean, again, because I knew nothing, I remember like teaching myself how to print in a communal lab in New York. And People were like, I really like these pictures. The prints are terrible. Like, can you not tell this is super yellow or whatever? And I was like, no, I can't. Thank you. <laughs> Let's fix that. Um, but I did, you know, I got into Yale and it was a total shock. And I guess maybe everyone likes to say that, but it was fair. For me, it was like, I was really just totally flabbergasted um, and unprepared. Like, I knew nothing technically. It was so. Uh, humbling and ch challenging to be there. I remember putting work up in the first crit, and Todd Papa George, who ran the program at the time, was like, so do you actually think these are good prints, or do you just have problems with your eyes? Like, those are my two, two options. Um, and it was, you know, it's just like you're hitting your head against the wall because nothing is working, and I was also away from my subject, like the thing that I did that was the most worthwhile was thousands of miles away and I was stuck in Indiana, Connecticut. And so after yet another, you know, horrible crit, I was like, I'm gonna make a picture. And, and it felt so transgressive. It's so funny for me to think about it now because I do it all the time and the whole thing, that sort of binary between constructing pictures or finding pictures, it just doesn't exist anymore. Um, but I, I remember, I, like, I was babysitting, or no, I wasn't babysitting, I was at my parents' house, my friend came over, she was babysitting this kid, she was like, oh, I forgot the diapers, I need to go get them, I was like, leave the baby, I'll take care of the baby, <laughs> so she left. And I still, it was like this weird, fiendish thing where I was like, take the baby's clothes off, put a red tablecloth on, throw the baby on the table, it's a five month, five month old baby, it's like, shock of black hair. And I think the thing that I liked about it was that because the baby is so young, doesn't know how to pose, that it felt kind of believable, even though it's totally stilted and artificial in some ways, 
there was something about the way that the body was moving, that slight movement, the gaze, that didn't do that thing that I was really against, which is a very stiff, still picture. So that was like a kind of opening of new possibilities for me. So I made, you know, this was from my MFA thesis, which I kind of don't, I mean, I, 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 I'm not proud of these pictures. They definitely feel like a very transitional place. They were super over the top. I mean, you can see the palette is like completely different from everything that I was doing before, but I was like working through something. And um, this, was, this was weird because I had a dream and I had a very clear idea. It was, I think I was looking at a lot of Caravaggio, um, this light and shadow and kind of beauty and violence. And I was like, I need to take a picture based on like sort of the head of John the Baptist in Salome. And I had this friend who married her high school English teacher, very strange couple. I was like, ugh, this is just so gross. It's like 40 years older than you. Um, but I was like, but they'll make a perfect couple for this photo. And I, you know, the light was really great. And so the, the sun is what decapitates the head and then the cross sort of goes through the eyes and she's so kind of this young, sensual, beautiful body and then his wrinkles around the neck. Like there was things there that I appreciated that again created that tension between things that were very, like the thing that I kept thinking about is I was making, that was like a visual equivalent of an opera, which is like very over the top, very dramatic but you still emotionally believe it. Um, and so I did, so Elizabeth and I were joking around about how like we are attracted to totally opposite things as artists, where she was like, where are your shadows, girl? <laughs> and here are my shadows. This is my shadow period where I did things with this like intense light and deep shadow that felt like were these gestures that were both, you know, kind of, I was like really into the merciless description of the camera, like the way that the kind of her weird teeth are described and the skin imperfections and the eyes that look like Venus flytraps and and the gesture that's like a headache or an orgasm or you know something in between. So all of that was exciting to me, but it also felt like this wasn't it, it was just an exercise. So um, I did after graduating, you know, um, doing some therapy. <laughs> I started photographing again. Um, but I returned to Russia and then eventually started shooting in, in Ukraine and felt like what I wanted to do was confront the present as opposed to mourn the loss of the past. And so um, my ambition was to just describe that post-Soviet moment that I thought I was witnessing. And this was now 2009, 2010. Um, it was kind of the middle Putin years. Uh, in fact, he wasn't even, he was prime minister for a hot second, and Medvedev was president, but really, you know, everyone was very clear about who held the power. And part of what was happening by that point was that the authoritarianism was back <laughs> with a vengeance. And um, Putin was incredibly successful in rebounding this idea of like stability and the, um, um, I guess, like, projection of power of the state through consolidating power to create what, you know, people refer to as the vertical of power. So Putin controlled everything uh, from, you know, it was a democracy, like, I think that the thing that he called it was sovereign um, democracy, which really, the emphasis is on the word sovereign. Uh, I it was basically czar from the beginning, where um, he controlled the church, the guy on the left, he controlled um, the media, the camera, he controlled the military, he controlled the courts. Um, all of that was under his thumb. So not much of a democracy. But I remember, this is actually, again, you know, not something I would do in a context that's not a an art context, but this is like an editing thing where I was going back and forth trying to figure out which one is the better picture. And initially I was leaning towards this one. Um, I liked that the camera was sort of looking out one way and the woman with her hand and this pink dress, it just felt like a stranger image. 
But in the light of current events, I think I'm leaning towards this one, mostly because it does have that clear reference. In one picture, it describes the blue mistake. Um, here is the white, red, and blue, you know, the white, blue, and red, and the Russian flag, the kind of hearkening back to the Russian Empire, a pre-Soviet empire, and here are the kind of representations of the peoples of participating in um, keeping this guy in power. So um, this was another image. Um, it was made after I watched this film called The Man with the Movie Camera. If you haven't seen that movie, fantastic. Put it on your list. Uh, it's a film from 1929. It's silent. Uh, it's incredibly experimental. I mean, the fact that this uh, Russian director, Rizik Avertov, made it when he did, it's, it's um, non-linear, like the narrative sort of moves all over the place. Like, on one hand, it's sort of a full day in the life of the um, young Soviet state, but there's also like the techniques are sort of crazy. He's doing double exposures, he's um, doing collage, he is made, there's some documentary shots, there's some very staged pictures, and one of the early shots, the second shot, is of a movie theater um, where, so again, it's like such a postmodern move to be making a film where you're constantly showing the camera, which is, you know, again, referenced here, um, and you can see in that, um, like, his brother played the cameraman who is the protagonist of the film, so making a movie about making movies. Funny, like, genius. Like, who was thinking about that in 1929? Um, and then seeing the audience come and gather in the movie theater. So this was my version of that picture, which is why I took it. Um, but now again, in hindsight, it's, there are more layers to it for me. And I don't know if you can see, but there is this little, there is someone making a little movie about the movie because of exposure. It's a four second exposure. I had like snuck in a tripod in there. Um, it was a bunch of old people and they didn't move, which is why it's sharp. <laughs> so it was like a bunch of kids. This wouldn't have been a picture. Um, but like this idea of a captive audience staring at this blank screen, um, totally absorbed by whatever is being shown, again, is about this um, you know, the thing that people keep talking about is like, how are the Russians not revolting? Like, there's not conscription, and people are basically being sent to sure death, and yet everyone is still sitting there as if they've been hypnotized. Um, and it, you know, for me now, looking at it, like, that is the thought that I had about the photograph. Um, this is the Red Square through a window. I was, you know, trying to figure out how do you make reference to the glamour that is the Moscow life of the mid-2000s. So the oil boom really did a lot for um, the quality of life because people's income tripled and so all of a sudden like, there were fancy stores and you know, $8 lattes. It was, I think Moscow for many years was the most expensive city in the world. And so I wanted to both show that reality, but then kind of contextualize it as um, this kind of fake creative thing. Um, and then this is another way of thinking about luxury and the promise of prosperity that is represented by this luxury vehicle that is supposed to be speeding into the future, um, and then until you realize it's fake, like it's an advertisement, it's flat, it's hollow, um, the actual world is where there is a homeless dog and this anonymous kid and a bunch of junk on the floor. Um, and all of it is, again, to kind of talk about formal issues instead of just content. Like the picture is, would be nothing without the fact that it's um, the gray palette, except for that red car that interrupts it, is the thing that makes it hard to understand what is and isn't real and that becomes the meaning of the picture. So the kind of conflation and flattening of space, which is something that I do 
I mean, I like I was talking to students about certain things that we are attracted to, and they become almost a visual crutch. Like you just do it over and over again. This is like my version of it. I have to like stop myself from photographing and taking pictures of other pictures because <laughs> I just love it so much. Um, it's also just like wild stuff. I mean, this was an old classmate who I reconnected with, um, and this was her living room. And, like I guess. This is what you do when you have a lot of money and not a lot of, um, well, ideas about, strange ideas about how to pair things. So it was just this total crazy hodgepodge of uh, objects from different countries that were all thrown together, but all of it meant to signal a kind of opulence and luxury. Um, this one I would argue is maybe one of the critical pictures in the project. Um, this was a horrible, horrible guy. Uh, it was another. You know, there's over all the years I've had a number of um, dicey experiences, things like I would not want my kids to do. And so I met him in a park. He was doing some kind of martial art. I really liked the way he knew. Um, I think I talked to people a little bit today. Again, photographers in the room. Like, how do you decide who you want to photograph? And most of the time, we are attracted to people because of the way they look, but I think eventually I realized that for me it's much more interesting, like what makes a person an interesting model is how they move as opposed to how they look. So there was a kind of strange awkwardness to his gestures that I felt like were very expressive. And that's why I approached him and I was like, hey, I'm a photographer, do you think you'd want to, you know, you'd want to do a photo session? And he was like, sure. So then when I went to his house and we were shooting, I realized he's like a completely insane neo-Nazi that started telling me about how he has fantasies about raping women. And I was like, mm, I think it's time for me to leave. <laughs> um, so yeah, we were just the two of us. Um, and my initial idea was I did, like going into the shoot, I was like, I want to take a picture of a man doing splits. Like, I like the idea of like kind of masculine subject being put in this not compromising position, but a kind of a mobile position. I felt like metaphorically that was rich. And so, and you know, I did ask him whether he were flexible enough, and he was like, yeah, but I need to stretch. So he started stretching using these chairs, and I was like, that's the picture. Like it's so much more interesting than if he was actually on the floor doing the thing that looked like exercise because it became about this immobilization and you know his legs look like they've been chopped off and kind of he looks both aggressive but also kind of pitiable um impotent but also menacing proud but also insecure and so all of it like this idea of a truncated man and he really looks again another Putin lookalike um I was like, this is this is emblematic of exactly what's happening in the country on the larger scale. Like this bitterness in the light of, of lost power and authority. Um, actually, this is the girl who lives in the gold in the house with the gold room. Um, and I started, you know, like when I made that earlier pictures, you know, remains, which is the, the pastel images before grad school. Um, I was like, I could never move anything, like that felt so forbidden and just wrong. And so then I had my um, kind of revelation in grad school. And so I started thinking about this both, like here I am documenting something, but I'm also a director directing actors. And so it became about a kind of choreography. And I liked the idea of this mysterious woman, like is she a double agent, you know, so maybe like this bond. I, I felt like this, this, I like the idea of her being someone who, like you don't know enough to be able to tell is she someone who just had sex for money or is she a rich girl, but like why are there no sheets on the bed? So the, the lack of context, but there still being enough details in the shot is part of what I was really interested in. <laughs> this was amazing. Um, I was not the only one taking pictures. <laughs> so this was like this absurd, it's in St. Petersburg. Pretty sure this guy was completely, completely drunk. 
and so decided to drive this excavator into the lake and see if he can row himself across it. And so he was like sinking in front of the eyes of everyone was using their like flip phones to um, record this. It was just like totally absurd. Um, but besides just being a funny picture, it's always good to have a funny, at least one funny picture. It was just, I think the thing that I liked about it was that it's like machinery, right? Like there's a special place in um, socialism for like modernity and machinery and how it represents that. Um, but it's also this like beautiful landscape that could be in France or you know, some, some beautiful place. And then it's like about this total failure and absurdity and all of these things collapsing um, each other. Um, luxury cars was like, how do you, for, for I, I knew people who would sell their apartment in order to have a really nice car because so much of one's status was tied to, in, you know, the former Soviet Union was tied to the car that you drove. So like, this is an Audi and I was thinking about this being this little ramp, like the car was about to go on this ramp and into the, into the sky, but then there were these eerie, creepy figures kind of hovering around it that made it a little more um, dark. This was another thing I was thinking about. So the pictures I'm showing you now are only, like only pictures that I took in Russia. I was photographing in Russia and Ukraine simultaneously, and eventually I only started working in Ukraine because I realized it was just such a more pleasant place to be. And Russia was getting scarier and scarier and it was becoming more and more challenging. But now I'm like editing these pictures for a book, and I'm like, here is this beautiful woman. Like, she's magical. Um, you know, totally forgotten little tiny shithole town in the middle of nowhere. I walked in because I was with a friend who was dropping off some paperwork, totally provincial, and she's there. And it's like, this is from a, she's from a movie. Um, she looks like she's from some 70s, you know, kind of 70s glamour girl. And then there's this other secretary, and I'm like, you know, if you're thinking about how do you want to represent Russians, like, this is probably the way that people are like perceiving it. But I was like, but is it a good picture? Or is this the better picture? And I don't know, I haven't, or maybe I need both. Um, but yeah, I, 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 it's so tempting in retrospect to make these cheap shots, to be like, you know what, the place is evil. Um, but I don't know if that actually honors the complexity or even the moment when I was making these pictures. Just another moment of amazing interior decor. <laughs> like I love that like there's just that tiny space above the, the rugs and they're like, you know what we need? A little painting. Just to make sure you fill that space. And yeah, this was uh, another great find. These plastic palm trees were everywhere. Actually, Russia and Ukraine. Um, I'm not. Sh I think I'm not sure who manufactured them, but there was a solid six, seven year period where all outdoor cafes had these palm trees around them. And I swear it's about this like living in a cold place and yearning to be in a warm place with palm trees, but the palm tree is plastic and it's <laughs> surrounded by snow. But yeah, again, it's that, that um, incongruity between spaces that I, I found interesting, but also, you know, of course, the color is nice, too. Um, this is one I just dug up from the archives. I haven't shown this picture before, um, but again, it feels relevant now. Um, this, I mean, there are so many images of graves um, coming out of both Ukraine, well, there's not a lot of pictures out of Russia of this, but there's obviously a lot of people dying on both sides. And so this picture of a grave digger takes on a different kind of meaning, a different kind of story. How are we doing on time, Elizabeth? Past time. We're already past time? Oh my god. All right, I'm just going to very quickly show some pictures. Um, an hour is just not a long time, I guess. <laughs> uh, so this is, you know, Talking about shadow and light, like this is a photograph of 
uh, place that looks just real enough for us to initially think we're looking at a real place because of the shadow. It gives a depth only to realize that, again, it's a kind of fantasy. And this is now in Kiev, um, Ukraine. Um, a totally wild, strange place um, called the Tiger Mansion. It was like a local tycoon who had a fantasy of building himself a palace um, where everything was tiger themed, and he really did it. He went for it. Um, that's the that's the palace itself, and the, part of what I think was sort of both poignant um, and interesting was that it doesn't even exactly look that nice. I mean, I think people were being like, okay, what should an expensive house look like? This should look like Versailles. It should look like some place, like a fancy place with columns and gold. Uh, but the way it's constructed, it almost looks like a reality TV set or something that is fake. And even the like astroturf with a crappy lawn doesn't exactly like make it look any more fancy. Um, and the curtain adds to the kind of flatness and theatricality. Like that felt like I was like, okay, this is really good, but how do I really communicate the strangeness of it? So it's not just about finger pointing at this absurd thing, which is too easy, um, but gets a, a sort of bigger idea. And then I started, I would on occasion go on set. Like I had a lot of friends in Ukraine that were working in film, and so I would kind of tag along, and this was a set of a reality TV show about like the rich youth, so like people who spend their time living in the lap of luxuries. So this, this young man was, was, I think, a son of some higher up politician. But I like kind of wanted to break open this idea of the set by putting the microphone and the clicker and so on. Um, as a way of signaling that all of this is mediated. That part of what was interesting to me about Ukraine was the way that this new identity as a relatively new nation was being performed. Um, and it was real and not real at the same time. And as I mentioned, like that borderline is very interesting to me. So I would go specifically, have lists list of places I wanted to go, like the karaoke um, bar. And then this is, you know, I wanted like a rich guy. And it was hard to find one that would agree because they're all doing sketchy things. Um, but this one was, was game. <laughs> um, and I was like, Alexei, you're really, you look really good and you play the part really well. I was like, well, what part is that? It was like someone who projects sex and power. And he's like, okay, I can do this. And so he like definitely put on a little show for me. He was like yelling into the phone. And, you know, slapping the secretary's butt and so on. Um, but yeah, this sort of exaggeration of gender was something that was very present in um, both both Russia and Ukraine at the time. And again, these pictures are now almost 10 years old, and things have changed so rapidly. Ukraine had become like much more sort of in, almost indistinguishable from Western Europe, which is not really true of Russia. But at the time, there was still, you know, a lot of exaggerated femininity and masculinity, and that was part of what was interesting to me. Um, this one, maybe I'll spend just a tiny bit of time. Um, but part of what I really love is the kind of formal disorientation and how that can become a tool of conceptual complexity. So this is a site of fire. We're looking at what is an interior of a restaurant, but because of how I photographed it and because of the way that it burned, where there wasn't anything charred, um, you like really can't tell what is what and where we are in relation to this. So the, the there's that added layer of like the photo wallpaper that's meant to be like, we're in a beautiful Mediterranean place that seems strange in relation to these rocks and stones and other things that look super dilapidated. Um, all right, I should really wrap this up. Um, but this is, you know, same, like talking about religion felt very important because the country went from being totally atheist to quite religious uh, in Ukraine and that played an important role. But I like the idea of this choir boy being like what looked like an American suburban basement. 
Um, so we scouted several because I was like, should he be in a garage? They had like a garage, two car garage that also looked like a kind of suburban reality transported, but the color in the basement was so good. I was like, this is um, it. And I know I we looked at people's work today. There's a lot of um, studio work. So. I forgot to mention this, but I work with only natural light. So even though this looks really lit, it's it's it was just available light and sort of identifying the direction from it and making that work. Um, gender and gender expression was something that felt like incredibly important to reference. Um, I mean, Russia is an incredibly homophobic place. Like it is utterly horrible. Um, there's queer people really suffer um, and are, you know, violence and um, imprisonment. Uh, Ukraine at the time was like certainly a more tolerant place, but even so, there I think that kind of um, hangover from the Soviet intolerance was part of it. Um, but I became friends with this person who was going to perform in a um, kind of travesty show and uh, allowed me to photograph them when they were getting dressed. This is someone I just met in a store. And I was like, you are amazing looking. Can I take your picture? <laughs> um, so it did also, like, I wanted to comment on the violence. And I started making this work after 2014, after the Crimea was annexed, and after the war in eastern Ukraine began. And so some of these pictures came from there. This is a totally constructed photo that came from this strange idea I had of like men holding a snake that was too big and it couldn't be contained. And I stumbled on this zoo where you could rent animals. And I was like, how long? How much for a snake? And they were like, $50 for a few hours. I was like, great, let's do this. He's like, but you have to bring your own car. So I show up with, like, to pick up the snake. And I'm like, will someone come along? They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll send our guys. So I, a friend of mine came in his, like, tiny, I don't know, whatever it was, Skoda. And these guys come out with literally a canvas bag with this snake winding in it. They were like, open the trunk. Just drop the snake in the trunk of my car. And then we went and photographed it in my Airbnb. Um, the most terrifying hour of my life. I'm like deathly afraid of snakes, but it's a good picture. <laughs> um, so again, like it's a little maybe hard to tell, but I don't know if you can see the bloodshot eye. So another way of quietly talking about this um, boiling over here uh, as a soldier who was about to be deployed to Eastern Ukraine, or you know these guys who are in Navy school learning how to tie knots, but of course, like, the thought is that it's a reference to um, hanging. I think my microphone just died. Which is really the way to, <laughs> <laughs> that is how I know it's, it's time to end. Um, anyway, but that, I'm actually almost done with my slides. So, this is the last picture, and it's the poster. Um, and, uh, yeah, this is, uh, I hope this little store is still there and given how many buildings have been bombed I don't I just don't know so anyway thank you for being patient What's your favorite lens and what's your favorite type of film? 
Um, really good question. I love people sometimes feel so cautious to ask questions like that, and I think it's like crazy to ask. Um, I am a great believer in a normal lens. So I shoot with medium format, and it depends on the camera. So on the Mini 7, um, it's an 80 millimeter. I was also using the G6-9, and that's a 90 millimeter. Except when I make portraits, which are usually on a tripod and inside, and then I use a wider lens. It's a 65 millimeter for a Mini RZ. Great, great lens. So you just like want to stretch space a little bit, but part of what I like about using the normal lens is it doesn't let you get lazy. Like you have to like move back if you want to include more, get closer. Um, and I use Portra, Kodak Portra 400 film, which is getting way too expensive. Way too expensive. It's like a fraction of the price. Every time I buy film, it's like gone up 20%. It's terrible. What's your bucket list country to go shoot? Oh, that's a really good question. You know, or Japan city. was pretty amazing. Um, so I guess it's not a bucket list because I just went there, but I was not there nearly long enough to do anything meaningful. So I would absolutely love to go back. And, no, no, it takes a while to, the like part of what I worry about in going places I've never been is that everything is new and everything is interesting. And you don't want to be that person making the cliche pictures because you're like in India for the first time, you know? I mean, there's so many places to go. Um, but I, I mean, there's so much, I, I, I don't want to say Eastern Europe because it's like been there and done that. And, the references are similar, but I do really love, like the thing that gets me excited in a place is that mismatch between kind of the way things are on the surface and what is underneath them for historical reasons, sociological reasons, and there's so many places like that. Well, I don't know, I really want to go to Argentina, I guess that's mm -hmm. the top of the list, um, <laughs> to make sure I'm not totally avoiding this. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're next. <laughs> oh. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I was really curious to see, like, um, I know that you talked a lot about, like, you took these photos years ago, and then you're, like, now recontextualizing the meaning behind all of these. Um, what made you do that? Is this something you do often where you look back at photos and sort of recontextualize things, or is it the current events? Current events. I mean, again, I really should have published a book a long time ago, but I'm a very decisive um, person, and I did some edits, and it didn't feel right, and then I waited some more, and then I had a kid, and then I had another kid, and so I waited some more, and then I got distracted with LA and waited some more. And now it's really crazy time. Like I cannot sit on pictures in these two places. Like this is so charged. And I do think it's interesting to look at, you know, this place that has basically exploded in violence like prior. You know, I, the thing the analogy I had was it is kind of like looking at the Weimar Republic before World War II. Like what are the seeds that have like how did people miss all of the you know, all the signs, right? And so that, I think, is the thing that has really made me much more motivated to resolve this. But also, like, I don't know, it's healthy to re-examine one's assumptions as an artist. It's hard, because it's much easier to tell a kind of story. Like, you know, all artist talks are a form of self-mythologizing, in a way, because people make it seem like you have clarity, I don't know, if you agree or disagree like it makes it seem and it's really daunting as a student because you're sitting there and you're like it seems like these people just knew exactly what they were doing and then they did this and then it led to that like that is just not true like there's so much confusion and anxiety and like dead ends and horrible pictures that no one will ever see and so on and so then you're like okay now I have this thing and it's ready to be shown and here's what I think about it. And then, you know, in this moment, I'm like, no, actually, I can't think that anymore. Like, the fact that I was like, does it really even, I wasn't even thinking like, now I'm in Russia, now I'm in Ukraine, these are very different places. To me, it was almost one place. 
And that was true for so many people, and Ukrainians have a real problem with that, as they should. I have a question. Yeah. So, you're not photojournalist. Not, she's not a photojournalist, but this work is completely polarizing, or, or a subject of a polarizing issue. So how do you kind of reconcile that, looking at photographs in the news right now? Because we all kind of see an image culture in Ukraine and Russia right, right now. Right. And things are so special, so kind of transcendent of that, and not journalism. So yeah, no, sure. it's really hard. And sometimes it's like right now is the time for journalists like to tell things as they are, it's not the time. And you know, photography is so trippy because even like as I'm editing, I'm thinking like, I know that I was approaching this work not as a documentarian. I was approaching this work as like, I am creating the story. It's of course based in truth and like what I was seeing and these are real places and they're real people. But they're also, you know, my, like, we are co-creating something, like, a lot of this is not something that was quote-unquote naturally happening in the world, like, this was staged or constructed, but it is photography, and people are real, and places are real, and in that way it's different from fiction, even, you know, feature film, and so, like, how do you understand or define responsibility? Um, and I, I don't know, I, I don't know, like there is no easy way to answer that question except to say that that's photography. Like it's just a very, it's part of what I love about it. Like it is real and yet it's a total fabrication. Um, and it's also, it's like a challenge. And like there is some really important ethical issues in all of this that we all have to wrestle with. Like it's a tool of power. Like you have taken something and you're representing other people. What do you do with that responsibility? Like how do you negotiate that? And you know, my students now frequently, like they just feel like they can't handle the responsibility and so the camera turns on themselves because they feel like they're an authority on themselves. And that's totally legitimate, but there is also a lot of other subjects and you know, how do you, how do you deal with that? Well, that's a great place. Oh, I'm sorry. There was oh, one more question. I just okay, have one more question. A real fast question. I know you were young, but what you're talking about leads to this responsibility of those earlier pictures of the bathhouse. And did you feel some mor moral ambiguity taking p pictures of people that did not know you were in that kind of vulnerable state? And yeah, did that, I think did that's that taunt very, you? Because I noticed you didn't do it again. I think At least that's you haven't a shown very, me that. very legitimate question. And I remember showing that work in um, a critique, and not the photo professor, who was perfectly happy to look at naked people, but the painting professor was like, you're immoral. You are, she didn't say I'm a monster, but she was like, this is so unethical. And um, I'm not making judgment. I'm no, just... I understand. I think it's like, it's a really good question. I, um, you were young, and I was thinking how you might have looked back. Yeah, and again, I would not do this now. Yeah, but, but, I do think it's an open-ended question. I guess I felt like, what were my motivations? I think that the artist's motivations are important. And I wasn't trying to embarrass people. I wasn't trying to defame them. I was trying to show life as it was, and in that way, honor something that I found like beautiful and revealing. Now, you know, I think it depends on where these pictures appear. Like, it was my undergrad thesis. I wasn't. This was before the internet really it was like a thing. Um, I think that that's maybe the difference is that because they were really not in a place of public consumption, so there was absolutely no way that people would be embarrassed by them. Um, a lot of the figures were very anonymous. Mm -hmm. That is how I, I guess, I justified it. Thank you so much, Sasha. Thank you.